Listen to Acts chapter 20, starting in verse 17. And when from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. And more than likely it was somewhere here that the Apostle Paul met with those Ephesian elders who had come all the way to Miletus and he gave those final farewell words, powerful words, warning them, reminding them, testifying to them, and challenging and encouraging them. And then the love they had for the apostle, they hugged on him, loved him, and, and they prayed. They prayed before Paul finally got back on the ship. And more than likely, somewhere here is where Paul walked down got on that ship, went back to Jerusalem. Now he will come through Miletus one more time, and this will be his final journey headed to Rome. And that's where the place we are, right here in Miletus, Asia Minor. Suppose you were a supervisor, maybe some of you are or have been at some point in time, and you have two individuals who are working for you. Both are hard workers, but here's the difference. The first one works for you based on how much you pay him. If you pay him more, he works more. If the conditions are good, his productivity goes up. He loves it when you come by and you pat him on the back. When you give him words of affirmation, when you give him words of encouragement, man, he jumps back into his work and he goes to work as, as hard as he can. Uh, he appreciates it when you brag on him in front of others. When you talk about how great he is, I mean, he buckles down and he works even harder at that point. His loyalty towards you and his faithfulness in his work go up, especially when he comes to you with some need in his life and he tells you, man, I need this money or I need this help or can you help me out, this and that. When you do that, when he does that and you meet that need, oh my goodness, he is your loyal servant forever because he knows you will take care of him. But if all these things don't happen, if his work begins to slow down, his attitude kind of gets sour. I know some of you Business owners and supervisors know exactly somebody just popped up in your head. His loyalty towards you starts fading, and he even stops working if you don't do those things. That's worker number one. Now, worker number two is different. He works for you, rain or shine. You can't remember the last time you gave him a raise but you look out the window and he is still plugging away with the same intensity. You haven't come by and patted him on the back in months, but it doesn't matter. It's been a while since you bragged on him before others, but it doesn't matter. In fact, he gets hurt, but he keeps working through the pain. He's still limping around and still doing what needs to be done. His family and friends turn on him, but it doesn't impact his attitude. He's a little concerned. He's a little perplexed, but he keeps plugging on. Uh, he gets mistreated by the other workers around him, but that does not for a single moment diminish his desire to work for you. And by the way, it just hits you that sometime back he asked for something but you clean forgot. <laughs> you did not answer his need. You just forgot. And yet every time you see him, worker number two, he has a smile on his face, no bitterness towards you, no resentment towards you. He is still working 100%. Now here's the question. It's not a trick question. Which of the two workers is dearer to your heart? Worker number one or worker number two? Which one? 
Number two, which one of those two would you trust the most? The one who, pay, who works for his wages or this one over here who will do whatever it takes because he's loyal to you? Which one is uh, one you will trust more? Of course, worker number two. This morning, uh, in light of our ministry expo that is outside, when you walked and you saw the table set up, it's a challenge. It's an encouragement for you to do something in the kingdom of God. And the message is called Devoted. We're going to learn from the Apostle Paul how to be the second worker, worker number two, who in spite of all that was happening, he still gave 100%. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 20, verse 17. That's the passage I was reading on the screen from Miletus, Turkey. Uh, Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. And the main point again is this. God desires for us to serve him. He especially delights in those who work for him with no regard for material or spiritual benefits. I believe some of us are working for God because we want to get something from him. I want to do this so I can please him, so he will answer my prayers. He will take care of my kids. He will heal the sick. He will bring some money in the bank account. I want to see kids, I want to see grandkids, so keep serving God, keep doing what you need to do, because you don't want to, you don't want to make him angry. God knows when we serve him from our hearts in spite of our circumstances. And although he sustains us in this life, he will give you the grace that you need. He will give you the patience that you need. He will give you the mercies that you need. Yet nonetheless, his rewards are not in this life. They are waiting for us in the life to come. Listen again to Acts 20 verse 17. I just read this from Miletus. He sent to Ephesus... And called for the elders of the church. Now the context of that statement is at the end of Paul's third missionary journey. In Acts chapter 20 verse 16, just the verse prior to that, it tells us that Paul was in a hurry to get to Jerusalem because he wanted to get there before Pentecost. So he is on this ship headed back from Greece to Jerusalem. And yet he thinks to himself, I need to stop and talk to the pastors in Ephesus. But he doesn't go directly to Ephesus. He actually goes to Miletus, which is a little south of Ephesus. We don't know for sure why. Maybe he did that because the port at Ephesus was not very convenient. There was a lot of silt. If you know what I mean by silt, it was very marshy. Uh, the Caister River kept depositing silt, so getting off the ship was not as easy. Maybe he didn't want to go to Ephesus because the last time he was there, there was a riot. People still remembered Paul. You're the one who caused that riot. Maybe he didn't want to go to Ephesus because he was banished. He was banned from coming into Ephesus. We don't know exactly the reasons behind it, but there's a reason I'm mentioning all this to you. Sometimes when you think when you serve God, everything should be plain and clear. Just a straight shot, and you can skip through the meadows and get to where you need to get to. Sometimes things are complicated. You have to deal with circumstances. Many of us had to deal with last week, in my life at least. It is not always clear. That's not the moment you say, why, God? It's the moment you go, this is part of life. So Paul even though he wanted to talk to the pastors in Ephesus, he had to come down to Miletus. It's a little complicated. Life is complicated. It's just part of life. But then he sends a man to go to Ephesus, which is a three days journey. It takes three days to cross from Miletus to Priene on a ferry. It takes a day. And then three days or two more days to get all the way back to Ephesus. Three days Paul has to wait. But then for the Ephesian pastors to come down, if it takes three days to go there, how many days do you think it takes to come back? Three days again. So how many days is that? Now think about it. The Apostle Paul, we don't think about these things, for one whole week is sitting at this harbor here somewhere 
in Miletus. And so the Ephesian elders leave. They come down to Priene, which is two days. They have to walk down the Roman roads, which, which are full of robbers sometimes, wild animals. They have to stay overnight. There are no hotels. So they have to stay somewhere in a tent. And then they had to get on this ferry from Priene and come down to Miletus. Again, we need to understand all these things are part of life. Here's a question for you. I know it's an unusual question. If Paul has sent a message to you in Ephesus and said, I want you to come meet me down in Miletus. How many of y'all would have said, absolutely, I'm dropping everything and I'm going? Wait, 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 before you raise your hands. Many of us would have said something like, ah, I wish you had given me some advance notice. You know, it's rainy season. You know, I got, I had a point, I have a doctor's, if I didn't have that man, I would be there right now. I guarantee it. Many of us would have made some excuse and said, I can't go. I'm so sorry. I really, I want to see Paul. Why don't you go? Well, well, where are we going to stay? What are we going to do? I mean, uh, you know, the ferry ride, it's really messy. So I've heard people drown. It was ankle deep water. I know, but you can still drown from that. I'm trying to get somewhere with this because many times what we do is we make some excuse because we're more concerned about our comforts than about our service. How about like the Apostle Paul? Would you have waited patiently? Have you ever thought about where did Paul stay for those six days? Where did he stay at the harbor? Did he stay in somebody's home? Or was he in some tent somewhere? Six days waiting. And not sure if the Ephesians pastors will actually make their way down. Six days, I'm just going to wait here. I got to get back to, to Jerusalem, but I'm just going to wait here. Patiently waiting. Patience is not uh, very important in our culture today. We want things now. I want things now. Give it to me now. Even sometimes when we come to church, I want it now. If this didn't happen right or that didn't happen right, we don't have a sense of patience. So think for a moment, uh, when you come to Clearview, do you stop to think about what all has gone into making a service possible? Can, can you see the plannings that go on, the workings that go on, the sacrifices that are made by people day in and day out? Here's the question. What part do you play in the happenings of a service? What is your role? How much do you help to contribute towards what is happening here? I'm challenging you this morning because I pray that as you make your way out, hey, Pastor, as you make your way out, uh, that you will stop at one of those tables and ask yourself this question, what can I do? It may not be that you will give hundreds of hours. It may not be that you'll give even 10 hours. But I hope that none of you will walk away saying, I'm good. I don't come to this church for that. I hope all of you will stop by some ministry and say, hey, listen, I may not have that much time. I'm in a very busy season of life, but I'll give you 30 minutes. All of us should have some part in the church body when we're actually doing things for his kingdom. Paul, he waits there. They come. But now I want you to pay close attention to what Paul says to the Ephesians pastors when they get to Miletus. And by the way, this is the only message in the book of Acts given to Christians. The rest of them are given to lost people to pagans, to philosophers. This is the only one given to Christians. So this, if you're a Christian, this message of Paul to the Ephesian pastors is for you. Pay attention to what Paul says. Acts 20, verse 18. He says, And when they had come to him, when those Ephesian pastors made their way through Priene, 
on a ferry to Miletus, when they got to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you. Why did Paul say that? You know, from the first day I came to Ephesus, you know the way I conducted myself. Why would Paul say that? You have to read between the lines. Paul was telling them that to remind them of his integrity, of his work ethic, of his trials and his tears in serving the church in Ephesus because there was a smear campaign. You know what a smear campaign is? They were trying to say that Paul came to Ephesus to take advantage of those people. They were trying to say that Paul had stolen their money. You'll see that in a few moments in that same chapter. They were saying that Paul was a coward because at the end of the two and a half years of ministry, Paul had to leave because there was a riot. He had to escape. And they were saying, look at this man. Talks about God and Jesus and resurrection and eternal life. And he was tuck his tail between his legs, and he was out of there. There was a smear campaign against the Apostle Paul, so he is calling those pastors down and saying, come down here, I want to talk to you before I go to Jerusalem, because I may not get to see you again. By the way, how did Paul live among them from the first day? To understand that, go back to Acts 18, verse 19. You can just listen to this. It says, when he came to Ephesus, he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. And when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent. So he would go to the synagogues. He would talk to his own people. What would happen many times? His own people would reject him. Sometimes they would try to even kill him. And he had to leave. So Paul came to the synagogue. His people rejected him maligned him, maybe even tried to kill him, and he left. And it says in verse 20, when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he did not consent, but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he kept his promise because on his third missionary journey, he came right to Ephesus. And he stayed there for two and a half years. How did the ministry begin in Ephesus? Very quickly, when he came there, he asked them the question, have you received the Holy Spirit? And their answer was, we don't even know if there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, in what were you baptized? Well, in John's baptism. And then he explained to them, John's baptism was simply to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. You need the baptism of Jesus. You need to receive the gospel. Listen, baptism doesn't save you, but baptism is a mark that you are saved. So Paul tells the people in Ephesus, listen, you have to come to Jesus Christ, receive him as your Savior and King. He is God's Messiah who died on the cross for your sins, was buried, rose again as promised. When you receive him, that's when you're saved. And they did. They got saved. They were baptized. They had a mini Pentecost. The Holy Spirit poured down upon them. And the church was born. Now, won't you say that's, a, that, that's an awesome beginning? What a wonderful story. Won't you say that? Man, that's a great story. These people were over here still baptizing by John's baptism. And Paul came and told them the truth. And man, they were saved. What we don't hear are the struggles that Paul went through in Ephesus. Listen to what Paul says in Acts 20, verse 19. It's on the screen here. It says, he said, I was serving the Lord with all humility. The Greek word there for humility is the word tapeno, frasune. It has the idea of being a servant. It has the idea of not only being humble, but being humiliated. Now, we don't see that, do we? That Paul served the Lord in Ephesus as a servant with humili humility and being humiliated. There's a difference there. Humility means I'm humble. 
There's nothing in me but what God is. Humiliation is when somebody insults you, calls you names, and treats you with contempt. Paul was treated with contempt. And then he adds to that with many tears and trials. When he was in Ephesus, he had many tears. We kind of go right past that. We don't think about it, that Paul had many tears. And also trials. Perosmos trials means uh, trials, but also temptations. Now pay attention to this. He says, uh, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. His own people plotted against him. Paul does not give us much more than that. But if you want to know what Paul went through in Ephesus, are you all still with me? You have to read 1 Corinthians. You say, wait a minute. 1 Corinthians was written to the Corinthians. Why would I read 1 Corinthians if I want to know what Paul was going through in Ephesus? Because Paul wrote 1 Corinthians while in Ephesus. Listen, if I'm writing something down, and I'm at, in Henderson, and I'm writing things about how terrible life is, and how tough life is, or, or how good life is, and how wonderful things are, it tells you how I am feeling right here. So if you want to know what Paul was going through in Ephesus, read 1 Corinthians. So let's read 1 Corinthians in the next few moments, starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. Turn there in your Bibles, because I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, starting in verse 9. I'll give you all another five seconds to find that, because I really want you to see this. I really feel many of us are not seeing the Word of God, and the Word of God is not being reflected in our hearts. There's something about looking at the Bible. I know we make things easy for you. We put it here, we put it there, everywhere, on the blog. But there's something when you open the Word of God and you start reading it, God's Word starts reading you. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. Listen to what Paul says. Listen, where is Paul at this time when he's writing 1 Corinthians? Oh, here is. Where is he at? In Ephesus. So, okay, let's go. 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Paul says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last as men condemned to death. For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. What does that mean, God has made a spectacle? Have you ever said that about somebody? Man, what a spectacle. It's an old-fashioned way to speak. What you're saying is, man, what a mess. What Paul is saying here is, we have been made a mess in the sight of angels and people. Keep reading. For we are, verse 10, what's the word? Fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. While Paul is in Ephesus, people are calling him a fool. Hence, Paul says, with all humility. Has anybody called you a fool because you're serving Jesus Christ? Has anybody called you a fool because you're seeking to walk by God's word? That's good. They called the Apostle Paul a fool. Paul says, We are weak, but you are strong. Don't ever look upon another believer who is weak at the moment, struggling, waiting for God to come through, as if they are weak, they're actually strong. Paul says, we are weak, but hey, listen, as long as you're strong, you are distinguished, but we are dishonored. There are people in Ephesus who are very distinguished. They have good jobs. They have good wealth. They have a good portfolio. Paul says, I know I'm being dishonored. That's okay. As long as you are distinguished. To the present hour, we both hunger and thirst. 
Do you know what it means to be hungry? And I'm not saying because you haven't been able to get away to go get lunch. I'm not saying being hungry because you're still waiting for the timer to go off on the oven. I'm saying hungry because there, you have no food. You have no money to buy food. When Paul was in Ephesus, you, we, we tend to think, man, he had everybody taking care of him, right? Are you all with me on that? Everybody was taking care of Paul. As Paul is preaching to them, as Paul is going from house to house, planting the church, everybody's like, Paul, would you like some baked ravioli? Paul, would you like some sandwiches? Paul, I made some fried chicken. No, he is hungry. He is thirsty. Listen to what else he says about himself. He says, uh, in the present hour, we both hunger and thirst, and we are poorly clothed. Means when you were, if you were to walk in, in that first church in Ephesus, find the man who is in tattering or tattered clothes. That's the apostle Paul. Look for the man whose robes are stained. That's the apostle Paul. What else? We are Beaten and homeless. In Ephesus, Paul was beaten, hence the tears. I think some of the tears were because he was praying for the hearts and the souls of the people to be saved. But at the same time, some of those tears were because he was beaten. Now, Paul doesn't give that list in the book of Acts, but he does mention that in the letter to the Corinthians means he was going through that in Ephesus. How many of y'all, you can raise your hand if you want, how many of y'all would still keep serving the Lord if somebody was out there beating you before you got into church? Right? I doubt it. They're like, well, uh, I know in my heart I'm saved. And we won't serve God. And yet the apostle Paul he is homeless. He doesn't have a place to stay. We think that somehow someone in Ephesus must have given the Apostle Paul uh, that room over the garage or that bonus room. Nobody gave him anywhere to stay. He was homeless. Where, where are you staying tonight, Paul? Well, I, I'll be all right. I'll be all right. Paul, um, uh, well, we'll see you tomorrow night for Bible study. Oh, yes, I'll be there. I know it's that home over there. I'll be there. Nobody stopped to ask the question, Paul, when you leave here, where are you staying? He was homeless. What else does he say? Listen, 1 Corinthians 4, 12. And we labor working with our own hands. It means the whole time he is building this church, getting beaten in the process, falsely accused, he is also working with his own hands. Being reviled, we bless. Being persecuted, we endure. Being defamed, we entreat. We have been made as the, what's the word? Filth. Do you know what filth is? Paul says we have been made a filth of the world. The offscoring of all things until now. You know, they were saying about the Apostle Paul that he was taking advantage of them. He says that in Acts 20, 33, he says, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you know yourselves that these hands have provided for my necessities. And for those who were with me, I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. Paul was being falsely accused. And Paul says, no, I've been working with my hands. I've been beaten in the process. I don't have enough good clothes. I am homeless. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. And yet I keep serving. Let me pause there for a moment and do some application. What keeps you from serving at Clearview? What keeps you from serving? I know there can be difficult seasons and busy seasons in, in your life, but I don't think that's really the problem. I believe you've gotten at the place in your life where you have become complacent, dry, and you don't give a rip about what God thinks of you. You will keep doing what you're doing. You're bullheaded. You're stubborn. You are taking pride in the fact that you can keep doing this and not serve God, and it's okay. Okay. 
You are the first, you're not, in, by the way, you're not even the first worker, you're over here. By the way, very interesting over here. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Turn your Bibles there as well. 1 Corinthians 15, 31. If you want to know what Paul was going through in Ephesus, read 1 Corinthians, especially 1 Corinthians 15, 31. Listen to what Paul says. I affirm, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I, say it with me, I die. Means while he is in Ephesus, every day is like death. It's a struggle. But then I want you to pay attention to verse 32. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 32. If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus. Now, there can be two meanings for that. One can be the beasts are people. His own people attacking him, maligning him, saying all kinds of things against him. But it could also be that Paul really was thrown in the gladiatorial uh, arena and had to face wild animals, wild bulls, lions. He had to face these beasts. Now, I can tell you this. One pastor over here would have quickly changed his profession. If I had to be thrown in a pit and have to face wild animals... You're like, you know what? It's not worth it. When Paul says, I was serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials, which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, it could be people plotting against him as wild beasts, or it could be actual, literal wild beasts. Second Corinthians, by the way, was written a year after 1 Corinthians. Again, it helps us to understand what Paul was facing at Ephesus. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 8. Can you turn there? You were in 1 Corinthians, just a few pages over. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 8. Listen to what Paul says here. He says, We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Hard pressed on every side. I mean, from every direction, pressure keeps coming. Yet not crushed. What happens to the first worker? A little pressure comes and he is gone. Second worker, he is pressed from every side, yet he is not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Perplexed. I'm confused. I, I don't know why this is happening. I don't know why God is not answering certain prayers. Perplexed, but not in despair. Means I'm not hopeless. I have not given up. I may be confused right now. How many of y'all are confused right now? Is there something you're praying in your life and, and it doesn't seem to come? But you're not in despair if you're serving God. Persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. If you see some saint of God struck down, don't pity them because they are not destroyed. They're going to rise up again. How about you? Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Verse 12, so then death is working in us, but life in you. You know what the life is of the second worker? Death is working in him, but other people find life. This is the Christian life. We die so that others can live. Many of us have it backwards. We want others to die so we can live. We want others to sacrifice so we can have more. We, can, we want others to step to the side so we can have the limelight. 
The Christian life of the second worker is the opposite. We die so the others can live. Now, go to 2 Corinthians 6, verse 3. Again, this gives us a glimpse of what Paul was going through in Ephesus. He says, we give, 2 Corinthians 6, 3, we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. But in all things, 2 Corinthians 6, 4, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God in much patience. Hey, you're getting things right away. You, you ask for it, you get it. You have money to buy it. You have resources. You have people. Things happen fast for you. But then there are people, things don't happen fast for them. Hey, listen, before you pity them and go, they just might be the second worker. They're waiting, but that does not mean God is not listening to them. Maybe it is because God has something better for them in tribulations, in needs, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in sleeplessness, in fastings, by purity, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love, by the word of truth, by the word of power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, uh, uh, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold. By the way, has somebody ever called you a deceiver? Has anybody ever called you fake? Has anybody ever called you just a poser? They called Apostle Paul that. So don't listen to them. You see, this is the deeper Christian life. This is when you realize, oh, wait, I thought Christian life was down here. You go to church and be a good person. This is the deeper Christian life when you begin to realize when all those things are coming against you in the process, God is putting more and more of his grace upon you. What appears to the world is that you're losing. But actually, you're standing in the line with the Apostle Paul. Listen to this. This is 2 Corinthians 6, 9. As unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. That's the second worker. He has nothing and yet he owns Everything, And I'll explain that in just a few moments. I don't have time to get into 2 Corinthians 11, 23, but I encourage you to go home and read that where Paul talks about how he was beaten. Uh, uh, three times he was beaten with rods. Five times he, was, he, he received 40, uh, 39 stripes. Three times he was shipwrecked. In night and a day I have been in the deep. You know what deep means? He was, uh, 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 he was marooned. Or maybe he was just bobbing up and down in the ocean. In journeys often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils, Paul was robbed. Did you, can you believe that? Somebody robbed him. As he's walking, uh, Nicole and I have been in Ephesus, walking down that main cardo, that main artery of uh, Ephesus. Somebody just brushed up against him and took the little money he had. Now, how many of you would say, God, come on, give the man a break? He, he doesn't have but a couple of dollars in his pocket. He is serving you. He is getting beaten in the process. And yet, Lord, look, you just allowed this, this thief. You saw the whole thing. Why would you let? And yet God allowed it. In weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Paul was cold. Paul was even naked at times because he didn't have anything. Who is weak? I am not weak. Who is made to stumble? And I do not. By the way, the worst thing to me was the thorn in the flesh. How many of you are aware of the Paul's thorn in the flesh? Anybody? You know, Paul was getting so many visions. And you would think, man, you're learning the deep Christian life. God says, put a messenger of Satan on him to keep him humble. I'll talk to you for a moment. When you see somebody who walks with God, 
having a thorn in their flesh. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's some conflict. Maybe it's some financial struggle. Don't walk away going, well, you know, I just got to keep them in prayer. It's you who needs prayer. God has given a thorn in their flesh. Why? So that he can pour his grace upon them. And then Paul concludes what? When I'm weak, then I am strong. His grace is sufficient for me. Imagine with all of this and still having this thorn in his side. Now pay attention to Acts 20 verse 24. Paul says, but none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself so that I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Paul says, I know I'm going through all this, but I don't care because I want to finish that race. Our time is up. Let me say this very quickly. Find Acts chapter 20, verse 32. It's right here on the screen, okay? Now, I want you to, everybody look up here for a moment. I'm going to point out a word for you that I want you to remember. The difference between the first worker and the second worker ultimately is this. The first worker is working for his wages. The second worker is working for something else. What is the something else? Now read with me. So now, brethren, let's get that camera in such a way that we can get the whole scripture, okay? So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an, what's the word? What is an inheritance? Inheritance is something that a father or a parent passes down to their son or daughter, right? Isn't that an inheritance? The first worker is working for his wages. God, I do this, so give me this. God, I work for you, so answer my prayers. God, I am faithful, so be faithful to me. The second worker is going through hell, literally, but he has a different mind, and his mindset is not for wages. He is working for inheritance. What God is saying the whole time, what the boss is saying the whole time is look at him over there. Look at this guy right here. If I stop patting him on the back, and if I stop giving him all this and answering all his prayers, he stops working. Here, he keeps doing it. What he doesn't realize is this. I've already signed off all my property, all my bank accounts, all my assets over to him. Friends, are you going to get wages? We love to quote, when we get to heaven, we're going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. I mean, that's great. I want to have the inheritance. Inheritance is far more than wages. Means everything he has is now mine. What Paul is saying to them, those Ephesian pastors is, you know what I went through, you know my tears and my trials, but listen, I'm working towards an inheritance and I hope you do too. Among all those who are sanctified. You know, what we go through in this life is part of the sanctification process. All that that's happens to us is part of the sanctification. There are things in our lives that God is bringing to the surface. He turns up the heat. He leaves certain prayers unanswered. He breaks you, and it is unfair. Life sometimes can feel very unfair, especially if you're trying to serve God. But what he's doing is he's purifying you. His goal is not just to give you all you want and have a happy life. His goal is to make you more like his son, Jesus Christ. Hence, Paul says, I would rather glory in my tribulations... So the power of Christ may rest upon me. I don't know where you are, friends. Which one would you rather have, the first worker or the second one?
Which one would you rather have? The one that has to be patted on the back and boy, he goes like gangbusters and starts doing things. Or you wanna have the second one. The master hasn't even come by to check on him and he is still out there serving the Lord. I wanna be like this. This one is working for wages. This one is working for inheritance. And this morning, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there is no inheritance for you. There is a place called hell, a place of burning forever and ever, reserved for Satan and his angels. But because you reject Jesus Christ, that's where you're going. So forget about wages or inheritance. You're going to a place of punishment. And Jesus came so that you don't have to go to the place of punishment. Come to him. Receive Jesus as your Savior and King. And then go to work for the Lord. Not like this one, but like this one.